But my next question is going to be for Melina, and we're asked, we're seeing a lot of excellent questions coming in through the Q and A. Many of them are actually by high school students, so people who may be juniors or seniors in high school, and you know that's early on in the game. But at the same time, what advice, Melina, would you have to somebody who knows already at the end of high school that hey, I want to be a doctor. What should I be doing right now to put myself in the best position possible to do well and to become a physician? Um, well, first of all, that's amazing. I think a lot of us, at least myself, I was still lost in high school as what I even wanted to do like the next weekend, let alone as a career, even if it was an interest. So congratulations. Um, I think that something that you can do early on is to talk to as many physicians as possible. I think Part of the reason that there's a lot of negative discourse about going into medicine is because I think some people don't experience enough or shadow enough before they apply to medical school to know exactly what they're kind of getting themselves into. And I think at that stage, even in high school, it's really nice to get to, to be able to shadow if you can, even as a volunteer, um, to see if this is something that you actually want to pursue through college. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is to kind of along the lines of what we've already been saying is to find a niche. So for example, in high school, I really liked Spanish. I loved like Spanish language. It really has nothing to do with medicine, but my Spanish teacher was like, oh, I have an opportunity over the summer where you can come and teach ESL um, to some of my students at the church. And I was like, okay. And that kind of kickstarted the entire experience that actually got me interested in medicine, public health, immigrant health, and I stayed on with that experience all through pre-med and college as well. And it was the basis of my essays and the basis of my um, interviews as well. So I would say, dip your toes into as many different experiences as you can, because you'll be surprised at which one ends up bringing you um, the kind of standout experience that you're gonna talk about in your med school applications. Right, and, and you never know which one of those experiences is going to be the one that you really, really find enjoyable and just pursue in depth because it's not just exactly. It's really about in-depth quality of those experiences and being able to talk about them, right? Um, and so, Dan, question for you: You mentioned your application to medical school, and you know it's important to kind of tailor your school list too. So, if someone's planning to apply in a few years and doesn't really, you know, there's obviously. There's hundreds of medical schools total, and they might not know which ones to apply to. What advice would you give about creating a school list um, and then deciding on who to actually send the application to? There are, there are many resources that one can use to get a list uh, and then to kind of pare it down appropriately. Uh, I would say the best place to start would be your undergrad uh, advisory office. Obviously, if you were removed from undergrad like I was, this is not as good of an option. Um, it's not that it's not an option, but maybe they're not as familiar with you anymore. Um, however, there are also other things, other other reasons you can look at to kind of like what are the minimum, you know, usually the minimum MCAT scores or whatever. I know a lot of schools tend to say they don't uh, do those things, but well, ultimately, at the end of the day, a lot of them do. Um, honestly. A lot of this process in medicine is about being honest with yourself and about what your skill set is and about what your capabilities are. And so I, I I think at the end of the day, that's really the best strategy. And you know, there's there's so many opportunities to judge people in medicine. And we just we try our best not to, but th this is one of those cases where it's like, don't we don't nobody nobody's judging you here. Pair your list with um sort of what you know you can accomplish and then also like where you want to be. Maybe you don't want to be in a place that's really hot. So maybe avoid the Southwest or you don't want to be where it's really cold. So you should avoid the Midwest or the East Coast, you know, stuff like that. Cause you know, you're going to be there for four years and it's hard, really hard. So, you know, get, you might as well enjoy yourself uh, where you are. Southwest kind of nice though. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Coming from someone who grew up on the East Coast, like I, I can, like, I'm not confused as, at all as to why you said that. Yeah, there's, you know, it's, it's such a good point because you're physically going to have to be there for medical school and then you're physically going to have to be where you match for residency. So that's a really interesting point about applying where you actually want to be located. Um, and the next question is going to be uh, to Josh about questions that we've gotten about study strategies and overall how to do well. We've talked about the importance of having a high GPA and a high MCAT. And then obviously during medical school, you want to do well. And during, you know, you're studying for the board exams, you want to do well on your board exams. How would you, how would you approach 
you know, that question, it's just studying how to do well in, uh, you know, a school educational environment, get a high GPA, do well on your standardized exams. I think that's a very loaded question. Um, <clears throat> and what I'll say is that it's a combination of two things. One, there's plenty of research to support some evidence-based study strategies. So if you like, for example, flashcards um, as one way of spaced repetition to constantly see the same things over and over again to build your memory and knowledge, that's one way. Um, but on the aside from evidence-based, there's also personalized study strategies. So some people just don't like flashcards, so that thing doesn't work for them. Um, and so there's two ways of going about figuring out what strategies work for you. One is through trial and error, and you figure out what things work for you depending on the class and the type of material you're trying to learn. And then another thing that Dr. Ray has pointed to is that if you have access personally or as a part of your organization to an education psychologist or an education researcher who can sit down with you and kind of take a look at the data, meaning your specific performance in certain classes and materials and try to figure out what works best for you given your study schedule, how you like to study, how much time you can dedicate to studying, and then can kind of point you to resources or different things that have worked for students in the past who have similar types of patterns of behavior. And I think that allows you to take some of the things that's known in science to say what works and what doesn't, while also making them a little bit more personalized in terms of what you're able to put forth in the process. So I hope that's helpful. No, that's, that's really helpful because, you know, there are definitely ways to do well and, you know, it's different things work for different people, but having that ability to really like dig deep and figure out how you study well, which could be different at different stages of the game too. That's really helpful. And we've mentioned it before, but even working with a tutor can be really helpful if that's something that you need for a specific exam or in general. There are a lot of resources out there and um, you know, doing well, it takes a lot of hard work, but there are ways that you can really boost your chances. So that's a great answer. Um, and the next is gonna be about something that we got asked, I think really early on. Um, it's gonna be from Melina and it's gonna be about a day-to-day. Every day to day is different, right? All four of us have a different day to day. But you know, what is it like being, you know, in your shoes for a day, uh, Melina? What is it like from the time you wake up to go to work to to get things done? What is it like being a physician? So my life is definitely much better now that I finished residency. That is for sure. Um, so currently, as an endocrinology fellow, I guess my job is to become to develop an expertise in a specific specialty of endocrinology. So. It's a lot more, you know, trying to figure out how to study on my own time and to create um, an, an interest within that specialty, but the hours are much better. So I typically don't have to be in the hospital till 8 a.m. Um, I have like didactics from 8 to 9, and then I see patients all morning, and then I do consults all afternoon in the hospital. So any patients that are admitted that need an endocrinology consult, I will be that person that's called, and I will staff that with my attending. Usually I'm home by six o'clock. Um, the hard thing though, is that, you know, when you're doing an outpatient based specialty, as I alluded to earlier, there's some work that you have to do from home just because you have to finish notes. You have to prepare for the next day. You have to get back to patients and call them. And so I do often um, do one to two to three hours of work after work, but not commonly. So my job generally is much more like a nine to five now, which is specifically why I chose this specialty. Um, not saying that as a woman, you have to choose a specialty like this, but for me personally, for my mental health and for the fact that I want to prioritize my family in the future, it was something that I did intentionally. So I'm very happy now with my schedule. Awesome. I see Dan over there saying hour, like hours of work after work, <laughs> like in emergency medicine, it seems more like shift work, right, Dan? Absolutely. I don't even know what it's like to be working from home. Uh, I mean, and, and you know, there, there, are, there are benefits to that, too. I mean, some people like working from home. Uh, but when I'm at home, I am not working. I'm watching TV, I'm eating, I'm going to the gym, I'm swimming, I'm doing whatever I want to do. Uh, and I know when my next shift is scheduled, then I go to work and I do it. Um, but uh, that's what, what one thing that's really nice about emergency medicine is that it is shift work. It's very defined hours. Uh, there's no call. Uh, that, that being said, Part of being an emergency doctor is you have to take care of critically ill patients. And the way that we do that is by doing ICU rotations. So ICU is, of course, an inpatient rotation. And uh, depending on which ICU you're working in, you can work uh, 12, sometimes 24, sometimes 28 hours. 
And so then it's a really, really long day and it's not great, but that's only for a month at a time. So, and you can really, you can do anything you want for a month. So, um, so yeah, uh, but one thing that's great about emergency medicine is that it's shift work. And a lot of times there's opportunities to um, kind of pad your pockets a little bit. So if you want to do, if you want to make a little bit more money than maybe some of your peers at your job, you can uh, elect to do all night shifts. Like I love night shifts. I love the night crew. I love the the vibe at night. Uh, and so if I, I'm, I, I won't be doing this, but in my job, if I were to say, hey, I want to work all night shifts, most likely I get a little bump in pay, which is nice. But all these things are, are a bit characteristic of shift work. And the, you know, once you get home, no work. You just, you just sit and do whatever you want. Gotcha. That's awesome. Uh, and